Welcome everybody. We are here today for a roundtable discussion on the fascinating topic of artificial intelligence and we're delighted to have with us uh, five esteemed members of our CIS community and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. My name is Edwin Lagos. Uh, I teach year 12 and 13 computer science and I've been at CIS now for five years. My name is Neetu and I've been at CIS for 13 years. I'm also in the computer science department. Hi, I'm Adrian, and I am a year 13 student. Hi, I'm Terry, I'm a year 12 student. Hi, I'm John, I, I'm an alumnus and, uh, and a parent. I wanted to perhaps start off the, the conversation just by getting clear of some of the key terms that we typically use when we're talking about artificial intelligence. And I can start with the basic definition of what artificial intelligence is. And uh, I think, uh, simply put, it's just trying to have a machine mimic the intelligence of the human being. And how we do that would perhaps be machine learning as one of those. Options. AI is a very broad blanket mm -hmm. term for getting computers to try to make intelligent mm -hmm. decisions. And that goes yeah. back to the beginning of computing. Mm -hmm. um, but the sort of hot topic these days and what people tend to refer to as AI these days is actually machine learning, which is mm -hmm. getting the computer to do the learning by itself. Um, and typically that is either via feeding it large amounts of data through which it tries to uh, mm. detect patterns in the data or else by getting computers to uh, play, play versions of games with themselves uh, and mm. generate data that way um, and then use that to solve, solve problems. I think a definition for machine learning that I generally uh, think encompasses everything that should be encompassed is that it is a program or a system that perceives a either virtual or physical environment and takes action to solve whatever problem is necessary. Yeah. There's two or three terms that are generally used um, that refer to AI, like you said, which is just generally trying to emulate human thought. Uh, there's, there's machine learning, which is at the end of the day, just pattern finding, finding patterns within data. We have reinforced reinforcement learning, which is just trial and error, continue to try something within, say, two agents in AI, or two AIs going against each other, and trying to see uh, how often they got to the right answer, how quickly. And then there's deep learning, which is when you have neurons, or the neurons in my head, like you would in your head, yes. um, that would then try to find some sort of correlation between the data then those neurons will then sort of feed back from what they learned and try to get closer and closer to the answer. That's the term that connects to neural networks. So we're trying to simulate what happens in terms of when thinking or the thought takes place. So you have the neuron, you have the synapses, you have the connection, and there's the thought. And that's the type of deep learning that Edwin is talking about. Can you give us some examples of sort of the positive differences in our lives that AI is, is making? And I'm also really curious about your, your own personal favorite artificial intelligence is. Earlier in the days, I guess, um, you know, you will have like a stack of DVDs and then you have to like, you know, go through one and choose one. And now you have like Netflix, which just recommends, gives you like a world of recommendations and like saves a lot of time. And it also gives you like a lot more choices. Yeah. And my personal mm -hmm. favorite, I think, self-driving cars, I think are pretty cool. I watched a video of someone being stuck in like Target and it was raining, like heavy rain and yeah. they just got their Tesla to like drive over and like and then they got onto the car and I think that was like really cool. It would be natural language processing. Um, so there have been some, some notable improvements in the way that machines can understand text to, to the sense that we could understand text. So that wasn't possible few years ago, uh, where when it comes to just reading a, a piece of text and answering questions on it, and then sort of inferring what the text might be saying as well. Um, so we've just reached the point where machines have surpassed human intelligence when it comes to reading comprehension. Huh. It wasn't quite there before. And the thing that I certainly benefit a lot from is Google Translate similar translations. Yes. And, and again, if you look back just a few years, the quality difference is astounding. Um, and so I think that's really something where you say there's a tangible benefit to, to everyday life. And then on the, on the protein folding or general uh, 
um, bi biological modeling. Um, I mean, recently, uh, the AlphaFold algorithm, AlphaFold 2 algorithm by the Google team, um, the uh, improvements are astounding. This is a problem that's been studied for decades in, yeah. in computer science and chemistry. What, what is physics. the problem in decades to understand the structure of protein? So, I mean, depending on the kind of protein, the applications differ and, um, the ability to predict or, or the need to predict the, um, the structures at very, very high accuracy, almost down to atomic precision, um, is, is extraordinarily difficult to do, um, by any method and, and has been for decades. And yet suddenly with the new AI techniques, new machine learning techniques, the results are just orders of magnitude better than people were able to achieve before. It's interesting you mentioned the protein folding because I was thinking about we are in the pandemic and we have this mRNA vaccines now. Yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if AI was used to actually come up with this particular way of creating an mRNA vaccine. It's so amazing that our medical field is benefiting so much and it's one field I think where we see a lot of disparity between those who can get medical facilities and those who can't. I feel like interdisciplinary studies and interdisciplinary yes. understanding is key mm -hmm. to any problem solving, you know, and as a discipline, yeah. I think we are in a unique position where we can sort of find ways of integrating with almost all yeah. aspects of our world. I think um, it used to be a pretty common presumption that, you know, AI was this sort of big tech thing that you only see in the, you know, the world's most prestigious think tanks, and it'd be something really complicated, like, you know, predicting what the sequence of amino acids would be. But in reality, nowadays, AI really is everywhere. And like you said, it's been really immersed into every single field. In entertainment, even like Terry said, yeah. the Netflix recommendation system is technically classified as AI. With language, the translation mm -hmm. from one language to another is also AI. And personally, um, my favorite AI would be that um, when you go on Google Maps and you want to go from one place to another and you tell Google Maps, hey, find me the best route from point A to B, the route that the computer takes to find that route for you is actually also classified as AI. Yeah, yeah. Some of the things we're hearing right now make me at least a little bit uneasy, maybe because they, they represent such radical departures. Should we be concerned? The concern that AI would eventually take over is definitely a valid one. But if we look at um, the way AI has been pro progressing in comparison to human minds and human thinking in general, it definitely occupies much of the same space, but they're also distinct in their very own ways. So I think that in order to make sure that we aren't completely overrun by AI, so to speak, is that we maintain the uh, a solid um, distinguishment between the two domains. And, we oper and as humans, we operate in the sense that we help AI um, flourish as a tool for us rather than have AI completely replace what we, um, our purposes and what we stand to be. Helping students understand the ethics behind the usage of these tools is the most important. At the end of the day, the tools are created and someone's going to use them and that person needs to understand the effect that they're going to have on the world with the use of the tools. So if we can bring some of that education from K through 12, mm -hmm. uh, that's really where we can make a difference when it comes to philosophy, ethics, and computer science, or AI. I think anything new that comes up, right, because we don't know enough of it, we tend to approach it with fear. Anything, you know, and I, right. I think that's the same thing that's happening with not just AI, but anything that's new. We are fearful of it. I think instead of being fearful, I think what as a school we can do is demystify mm -hmm. AI. What is it? Mm -hmm. And who's making it? Who's writing all those algorithms? Yeah. Right? And what are these functions that on which this whole mechanism works? There's a lot of educational yeah. benefit in teaching people from a very young age, but adults as well, into how to critically think uh, about whether you're being manipulated by AI, which mm -hmm. is already obviously a big problem. And and it can be, you know, very nefarious manipulation, or it can be just very subtle, you know, marketing-driven. The best way of teaching people about that is by at least being being aware to to ask the question: Am I being manipulated, or is the situation being engineered for me? I want to ask a question about, um, if you don't mind, um, gender equity. Statistically, it seems like 
this field is attracting fewer women than that sh I think it should. Why is that? What can we do about it? I think it's definitely systematic. Like, um, I guess, I don't know if it has to do with the culture or anything. Like, like when, when we grow up, we, we get told, like, oh, and, uh, boys are gener generally better at this stuff. And I, I don't think it's the interest because I know I have a lot of friends who are very interested in this topic, but they think like when, whenever like we talk about CS, they're like, oh, that's too hard. Um, but I'm like, no, it, it's not. Mm. But it's because of the stigma around it. And like when, like when we're growing up, like what we were told about like this being like a guy's thing to do. And um, yeah, I think a lot of my um, friends that are um, girls like are actually really interested in this topic. But they just never had like the confidence and like the courage to um, go learn more about it. Yeah. For um, for many women at that at, at the year eleven juncture, uh, I feel that the more encouragement that they get from other women who've taken that course really helps. Uh, so that's where we've seen our numbers increase in that sense uh, when they can go talk to somebody else and say, "How do you feel about sports?" What has it done for you, and will I feel valued and respected and cared for within it? Um, so, hopefully, we continue to do a better job of doing that. Moving past that, once they do join the computer science course, uh, we've noticed that the vast majority of them end up then wanting to do computer science in university. We have students at uh, NYU and Columbia, um, we have students in the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, so overall, I think a lot of them will sometimes come back and talk to the current students and say, yeah. um, this is a good path for you to take, and then that, that will continue sort of the pipeline up when it comes to them. Um, but there are things that we can do within our courses all the way back to primary mm -hmm. that can help that for sure. Yeah, I think what happens is unknowingly we have these biases in us. And sometimes as parents, when we talk to our daughters in particular, and we, we, without even realizing, we'll say, oh, I realize you're not, you know, you can't do this math problem. I was so bad in university or in school. I couldn't do it. And you sort of justify that your child is bad rather than saying, that, hey, I, I see you're having a problem. Let's see how we can solve it. So I think that it's so ingrained in us that we really need to be conscious mm -hmm. about how we talk to our girls and how do we promote this idea that Anybody, girl or boy, anybody could do any subject. Thank you very, very much uh, <laughs> to you all for trying to demystify, and I think succeeding in demystifying what artificial intelligence is for those among us who don't know it as well as you do, but also for giving us a sense of the, the, the extraordinarily positive future that lies ahead. <laughs>